Okay, uh, especially uh, is, <coughs> your topic is hot news now. It certainly is. Yeah, and it's a great uh, to have an interview with you. I really enjoyed your interview with Dennis ah, it's on this yeah. topic. Okay, now uh, I'd like to focus on young people. Right, yes. Yeah. <coughs> uh, why is having a good sleeping pattern so important mm. for young people? Well, I think we've, we've realized fairly recently all the important things going on in our brain and the rest of our body during sleep. So mm. if you want to lay down memories, if you want to process information and come up with innovative solutions to complex problems, uh, it, it, a, a night of sleep has been shown enormously to enhance your, your capability of doing that. Interestingly enough, tired people process emotional information rather differently. Tired people tend to remember the negative things that they experience, but forget the good things. Mm -hmm. um, it, it should be the other way it, around. Yes, that's yeah. right. Um, and so you've got all of that brain processing, but then you've got the clearance of toxins, um, uh, the, 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 the release and the coordination of growth hormone, for example, which of course is not just growth, but it's also tissue repair. Mm -hmm. The rebuilding of metabolic pathways, the rebuilding of essentially food reserves, um, for activity during the day. So, so much of daytime function is dependent upon a good night of sleep. And so if you don't get good sleep, then uh, your cognitive performance drops away very quickly and long-term sleep disruption can lead to some quite important health issues. So it seems that tired people probably um, activate the stress axis, you know, the fight or flight axis. Now, short time, of course, this is very important for survival. But long term um, levels of the stress hormone cortisol can cause problems. So, for example, it will suppress the immune system and make you a little bit more vulnerable to um, infection. And very long term stress, as you see in night shift wor workers, can lead to high rates of cancer. Um, cardiovascular disease, uh, metabolic problems, so greater risk of diabetes too because the body is throwing glucose into the circulation. It's not being used um, and therefore you become glucose intolerant. So both short-term and long-term health consequences. And also if you are vulnerable to psychiatric illnesses such as depression, or more severe forms such as bipolar or schizophrenia, um, the uh, disrupted sleep um, can nudge you uh, closer to a sort of a, 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 an increase in the severity of the conditions. Mm -hmm. So, it, 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 you know, it, sleep is so central to so much of what we do. And for young people, you know, particularly, you know, going to school, learning all this information, a night of sleep is really important. And the problem is, they're not getting enough. What do you mean? Oh, the, 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 they're not getting enough sleep. I and mean, what's happening mm -hmm. is that um, the typical um, teenager, for example, mm -hmm. is going to bed late. Um, they're playing on social media. Mm -hmm. um, and then the alarm clock drives them out of bed on a, on a school day. And mm -hmm. some have only five and a half hours a, a night. And Mary Kaskadon... That's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> but you're not a teenager. <laughs> Sorry, not to be rude, of course. I know. Um, and... Um, uh, Mary Kaskaden in the United States has shown that for full cognitive performance, mm -hmm. teenagers need nine hours of sleep. Mm -hmm. So they're going to school tired, mm -hmm. um, they're struggling through the school day, they're then coming home and they may then take a nap. Mm -hmm. And then the nap may be one or two hours. And of course that pushes back the sleep pressure, mm -hmm. which means they're not, going, they're not going to sleep at the right time because mm -hmm. they're, they're more awake. Mm -hmm. So you have and this problem of, of, of not getting enough sleep because of social media and also um, extensive nap taking after school. Um, and uh, some of the, the studies that we've been looking at have shown that if you improve sleep in teenagers, and, and this has been done as a result of education. So we've, we've got, we've, um, the, the team have uh, prepared teaching packages for the teachers to teach the importance of sleep in the schools. And those uh, young individuals who had particularly bad sleep um, after the teaching uh, intervention had improved sleep and what was so important is their feelings of well-being um, and um, uh, overall health uh, seems to have improved. So, so it again illustrates the importance of sleep. So what you are saying is sleeping at the right time is really important? Yes, absolutely. Right. And, and it's such a vital part of our biology, you need mm. to prioritize it. So mm. 
the sort of sleep patterns are very different between individuals. Yes. Some people like to go to bed early and get up early, and of course many of us like to go to bed late and get up late. Um, and the, the amount of sleep that we need, some people need genuinely nine hours. Um, I think it's rare that g you can genuinely get away with less than five, five and a half. Um, but uh, you need to essentially assess your own need. And how do you know if you're getting enough sleep? Well, if an alarm clock is driving you out of bed in the morning, if it takes you a long time to wake up, if you're feeling really groggy for a while, if you're seeking out stimulants such as caffeinated or sugar-rich drinks, then all these are signs that you're not getting enough sleep. If your friends and family notice that you're lacking empathy, you're a little bit more aggressive, you're doing stupid and impulsive things, these are all signs that you're not getting enough sleep. And Critically, if you're massively oversleeping on free days at the weekend, um, sleeping in, again, it's suggesting that you're not getting enough sleep uh, during the workday. Oh. And so these are all important signs. And, and in fact, many people discover that their sleeping patterns change incredibly when they go on holiday. Yeah. And, and it's those sort of when you're in the relaxed state, uh, you're, you, you unmask your true sleeping pattern. Mm -hmm. And the key thing is that uh, you need to be aware of that. And prioritize sleep and if you're finding that you're tired you need to wind down before sleep and, and the other thing of course that people don't quite appreciate is that you can't go from the wake state to the sleep state instantly you do need a transition oh, and so that's interesting yeah I mean transition tra absolutely yes so for example we know that light will increase levels of alertness and therefore delay sleep onset so um, try and minimize light exposure, you know, not dark, but, but minimize light mm. exposure uh, for half an hour or so. I think it's quite interesting, but the, the one thing that most of us do before we go to bed is stand in the most brightly lit room, the bathroom, looking into an illuminated mirror mm. as we clean our <laughs> teeth. Um, I think there should be a setting in, in bathroom mirrors. So there's a night setting where it's a little All bit right. dim, and, 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 and in the morning where we need to increase our alertness, we turn it up. Um, mm. Nobody's built it as far as I know. You know, sometimes in the <coughs> middle of the night, you are awake, I'm yes. awake. Yes. Then I tend to work rather than, sometimes mm. I feel stressed. Yes. When I feel that I should go to bed, I should go to sleep, mm. and then I never... It's a very common problem. And in fact, if you look at the sleeping patterns of uh, humans in the pre-industrial era, mm. it was quite different from what we're experiencing oh, really? now. Yeah. So around about dusk, you know, when it started to get dark, there was a, a two hour winding down, a quiet ah. sort of preparation for sleep, yeah. four hours of consolidated sleep, mm. and then more people would wake up. Mm. They'd walk around, they may interact in various ways, mm. then they'd go back to sleep again for four hours, and then they'd have a two hour transition out. So I think what's happened is that within our society, we've compressed that sort of 12 hours of extended rest and sleep into a, a much, much um, um, reduced uh, amount of time. And perhaps waking up in the middle of the night is a throwback to that biphasic pattern. And the key thing is not to get stressed, is not to lie there thinking, oh my goodness, I've got to get, I've got to get back to sleep. Yes. Get Less up. That's the stress. Yeah, you, exactly. <laughs> you get up, um, maybe have a, a, not a caffeinated drink, hot milky drink or something, mm. listen maybe to some music, read yes. a novel, um, and, and Very relax. boring novel. Yeah, well, it, it does, <laughs> yes, in fact... It, but, Otherwise. Uh, well, uh, that's right, I never, before I go to bed, um, will read scientific papers. Or no. Anything. It's too, ex <laughs> too exciting. Um, and so um, I, uh, I, I do, I, I have pretty trashy novels, <laughs> which I use um, if I need to um, get off to sleep. So, mm. so minimizing that exposure, making time to go to sleep, um, and if you do wake up, don't get stressed and don't lie there mm. forcing yourself to back to sleep. Mm. You won't. Go to another place and when you're feeling more relaxed and tired, you return to the sleeping yeah. place. Okay. You know the uh, we now live in this uh, spinning world, yeah? Mm. And uh, lots of young people are suffering from insomnia mm -hmm. and depression, anxiety. Obesity. Yeah, mm. obesity, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, so how does um, sleeping pattern affect young people's well-being? Oh, Mental it's, well-being. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's huge. Um, I mean, there's, mm -hmm. there's a increasing concern that the 
um, for example, self-harm um, and depression in youngsters has been associated with uh, a loss of sleep. So when, when sleep has been improved in these individuals, mm. um, truantism uh, goes down, self-harm goes down, oh, depression goes down. That's very <clears throat> uh, after after um, uh, the sleep is improved in these individuals. Mm. And I think it's important that we don't mix up sleeping tablets with sleep. Mm. So you, you, a sleeping tablet will sedate you. It's kind you. of a habitual thing. Well, it's a, it, it's a sedative. And, mm. and, and so many people, for example, um, <clears throat> use alcohol as a sedative mm. to get them to sleep. Mm. Now these... Is it a good idea? No, no. no. Well, no, no, really. Unfortunately not. Um, because what these sedatives do is mm. that they actually interfere with some of the important things going on ah, in the brain during sleep. I see. So you then wake with the alarm clock mm. after a sedative-induced sleep Mm. Um, uh, and then you need more stimulants to wake you up, keep mm. you going. Mm. And of course, the problem is if you're taking stimulants like caffeine all day, mm. then you're going to need more sedatives uh, to get you to sleep at night. So mm. one has to be careful about that. Mm. Um, and, and ideally, you need to find those tricks that work for you. I mean, one, one, one thing, simple tricks in, in the bedroom. I mean, so basically, the bedroom shouldn't be too warm. Oh. It should be... It should You're be, giving an advice to me. <laughs> <laughs> it should be dark. Um, mm. I mean, clearly in, in some childhood bedrooms, night lights, but they're so low, mm. it, it doesn't really affect mm. things too much. Um, and, and it's fa turned out to be quite interesting. Why shouldn't the bedroom be too hot? And that's because part of sleep initiation is a loss in core body temperature. We lose about a degree mm. in temperature, uh, and that drop in temperature is, is, is important in sliding us into sleep. Ah. And if the bedroom is too hot, mm. then you can't lose that, that core body temperature as easily. Right. Mm. What, this is an interesting <laughs> guess. So what makes, a, what makes a someone an early bird or a ah. night owl? So this is an, a really important question. So um, whether you're a morning person or an evening to pers person it depends on, on an interaction of multiple factors. The first is genetics. There's a genuinely a genetic predisposition, um, tiny changes in the some of the clock genes will, will nudge you towards being a morning person or an evening person. The second is development. As we age, um, um, from the age of 10 um, to the age of about 21 and a half in males, we tend to go to bed later and later and later and later. Females, it peaks a little bit earlier, about 19, 19 and a half. And then after that, we s go very slowly to, to an earlier mm -hmm. bedtime. The time you're late 50s, early 60s, you're getting up and going to bed at about the time you got up and went to bed um, at the age of 10. And on average, and there's a lot of individual variation, on average, there's a two hour difference between somebody in their late 50s mm -hmm. and somebody in their late teens, early 20s. So for, I, I, so for example, asking a teenager to get up at seven o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. is a bit like asking a 55 year old mm -hmm. to get up at uh, five o'clock in the morning. That's the, the genuine difference. So there's genes, there's development, and, and, and it's probably due to the changing um, sex steroids, the testosterone, mm -hmm. estrogen, and progesterone. Mm -hmm. But light is very, very important. Now, what's really important to know is that dusk light delays the clock, makes you get up later. Mm -hmm. Morning light makes you get up earlier. Now, what's happening, in, in, particularly in young people over the weekend, mm -hmm. is that they are not seeing morning light because mm -hmm. they're sleeping in but they're seeing evening light. And of course, that will delay the clock. It will make them want to right. go to bed later and get up later. Mm. So light exposure is also very mm. interesting. And I guess the fourth component, uh, you've got genes, you've got development, you've got light, the timing of light exposure would be um, essentially social time, um, wow. as, essentially how we try and impose a sleep-wake um, cycle upon ourselves um, by cramming in so many different things. Mm -hmm. By cramming in so many different things during the, during the day, we, we, we erode um, sleep time at night. Mm. And uh, your research topic, circadian rhythm, yes. obviously very, very important in the Nobel Prize yeah. Yes, we're all very excited. You could have been in, no. and we all think <laughs> that you deserve it. Okay, so to develop this uh, research topic, what what's next? What's next? Well, um, I think w w 
the Nobel discovery uh, sort of got us to un- this platform to understand the molecular clockwork. And many of us have built upon that framework. My own research has been how light is setting the, the clock to the external world mm-hmm. so that everything is beautifully aligned. Um, and I think the more we've understood about the fundamental biology and the physiology yeah. of clocks and their regulation by light and how they regulate sleep, that's offered up some very exciting um, translational research. So, for example, uh, across psychiatric medicine, neurogenitive disease, um, uh, across cancer biology, we're beginning to see the role of the clocks in the circadian systems. And most recently, in our lab, for example, we've been trying to think of ways we can shift the clock, but pharmacologically. Can we mimic the effects of light on the clock with a drug? Why would we want to do that? Well, there's one very important group, people who have no eyes or who have very, very massive eye damage cannot see the light-dark cycle to Mm. set the internal clock to the external world. Mm. And so what happens is they get up later and later and later Mm. and later. Mm. So um, what we'd really like to do Mm. is hit them with this new drug Mm. and make sure that every day they're properly aligned. As if the brain had seen light, Mm. but it hadn't seen light, it's seen a pharmacological, a drug mimic of light. Mm. And I don't, I think it's, it's, it's very important, of course, critical in the blind, but it may also be useful in other conditions. Mm. So several years ago now, we studied the sleep-wake patterns of patients with schizophrenia, severe schizophrenia, Mm. and their rhythms are absolutely smashed. Mm. And Uh, one possibility would be to, at least in the first instance, try and hit the clock Mm -hmm. with drugs Mm -hmm. and then introduce education and maybe natural light exposure to -hmm. try and keep it on a stable basis. But I think that these these, um, agents that regulate internal time Mm -hmm. could have a very important role in in future Mm -hmm. healthcare. Obviously, you you live a very, very busy life. How do you switch off? Um, I love music. Um, What kind? Uh, classical, oh, um, right. and so uh, particularly, um, I yeah. love Wagner, um, oh. and so uh, uh, in fact, uh, my my family were away doing something on, on last Saturday, and so I took the opportunity of turning up the um, the um, music system to a very very you know, s- uh, I think it was eleven on the setting, um, oh, <laughs> and and uh, mm. uh, and listening to that. So I love music, um, and um, I do like to read. Um, I love history, and wow. so um, I read a lot of history and biography. <laughs> <laughs> In your break. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Russell Foster. Great pleasure. We Thank learned you. a lot, and the more young people may, they may be motivated to study science. I hope so. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a fantastic career. It's yes. something new and exciting all the time. Yes. Mm. Thank you very much. Great pleasure.